Anytime I receive a new lens, one of the first things I do is to check the sharpness of the lens. We have here today the new Nikkor 180-600, to and I'm going to be doing some tests to see how sharp this lens is, and I'm going to be comparing it to two other lenses that I own. Uh, one is the Sony 2-600, to which I use on my A1, and then the third lens is the Nikkor 800 6.3. So in these tests, we're going to do side-by-side -side tests and do a test just at all focal lengths of the Nikkor lens here. I do want to bring something up, though. The Internet is full of reviews and tests done with various telephoto lenses with birds, and nine times out of ten, these tests are done outdoors. Or it's not even a test, it's just a compilation of all these great photographs that someone took with their lens that they claim is the best lens. And the problem with this is, is that when you're shooting outdoors, you have to contend with atmospheric conditions. There's temperature differentials that are all around us every day of the week. Now, sometimes when the sun's out, it's even worse. Today's a mostly cloudy day, so the turbulence isn't too bad. But anytime you're shooting through the atmosphere, our own air, you run into the risk of having temperature differentials between the lens and the atmosphere, between the lens hood and the atmosphere. Uh, sometimes people will take photographs out of their car, and now you're dealing with temperature variations between the car and the air. And sometimes it's really bad, like in the spring, when it's really cold outside, but the sun is really strong, you'll get a lot of atmospheric distortion due to that. So if you really truly want to do a controlled test, it needs to be done indoors in an environment where there's little air movement, uh, no heat on, no air conditioning, a nice stable environment. So the tests that you're going to see today are going to be done indoors. Over the years, my test subjects have changed a bit. Originally, I used a test chart, but found that it was just not giving me any depth of field and any real continuity with what I might see with a real bird. So I switched to different models. And uh, the first model I had was a, uh, a fake owl made out of chicken feathers. and. Uh, eventually tried other things too, such as a stuffed animal and a smaller feathered owl. But my favorite of all for doing these tests is a Kachina doll that had a number of white feathers that were overlapped and had defined edges. And I found this to be the best subject that I could possibly use for these tests because not only would they show the uh, hairs or the individual uh, filaments of the feathers side by side, but it's also a very good test for moray. And occasionally I came across cameras that would produce, you know, colorizations uh, not only in photographs but also in video as well. And uh, so for the past couple of years, I've been using this Kachina doll. So even indoors, there's parameters that I try to follow. One is I keep my distance at about 16 feet or as close to the minimum distance as possible. And the reason why is, is that we're still shooting through air and there can still be some internal turbulence, although it is a much lower risk than being outside. I keep everything at about room temperature and I also acclimate the lens and camera to the room um, a good hour before doing any tests, just so that everything is at the exact same temperature. So before taking any pictures, I make sure that the camera is mounted on a sturdy tripod with a sturdy mount and located on a concrete floor. If you had a wood floor, there's a chance that any walking around that you or someone else might do in the room can cause vibration. 
Speaking of vibration, image stabilization is turned off. Sometimes either a lens stabilizer or a sensor stabilizer can cause minute movements. And when I shoot these shots, I'm shooting at a very low shutter speed. And the reason why is I'm shooting indoors and I want to use a low ISO. In this particular case, we're shooting at ISO 200. And that leaves me with a shutter speed that's down to around a 15th of a second. And speaking of which, because of vibrations of my hand hitting a shutter button, I do all my shots using a timer. This gives the camera, the lens, and the tripod a chance to settle down to make sure that there is absolutely no vibration when the picture is taken. Okay, in this first test, what we're comparing here is resolution at different focal lengths. And looking from left to right, um, we have uh, 180 millimeters, then 300 millimeters, followed by 400 millimeters, then 500, and uh, all the way up to 600. And uh, I, I, this is pixel pixel peeping, of course, um, but we're all at 100%. And, uh, you know, it's harder to see, you know, if it's really 100% sharp, I guess, at the lower focal lengths. But, you know, if you were to zoom in a bit, <clears throat> you know, you can see it. It's not going to look as sharp, but that's because I'm zoomed at 300%. At 100%, it looks tack sharp, and it is. So, um, as we go up in scale, uh, it becomes more apparent how sharp this lens actually is. And if we, uh, look, if we look here at the 600 example, you know, we can see that, uh, you know, we've got plenty of resolution here. Uh, this is tack sharp. Uh, it doesn't get a whole lot sharper than this, really. And it looks great throughout its uh, range. Uh, this was shot at f8 and the reason why I did f8 is that because it's 16 foot distance there is a depth of field change from the feathers that are in the foreground to those that are in the background and uh, when you shoot at uh, f6.3 you see that and again it's nothing to do with the sharpness of the lens it just has to do with the depth of field because what I would find is, is that the feathers that were a little closer than those behind it were sharp. So you don't have to shoot at f8 to know that this is a sharp lens. Even at 6.3, it is dead on sharp. Uh, you'll just have to take my word for it, I guess. But uh, nonetheless, uh, excellent performance at all focal lengths with this lens. Okay, in this uh, second part, we're comparing the Sony 2 to 600 on your left and the Nikon 180 to 600 on your right. Now, I'm not going to go through all the focal lengths because with both these lenses, they're sharp throughout their range. And what I'm really interested in is the maximum uh, zoom reach that these lenses have. And uh, so the first thing that you'll see that's... Uh, quite interesting is that you can see the Nikon, the Nikkor 180-600 actually is producing a larger size image, and a larger zoom let's say. It's closer to a true 600 millimeter lens. Now I knew about this with the Sony, but just to kind of explain things, when you're shooting at a shorter distance with the 2-600 from Sony, it's not really a 600 millimeter lens. It's more like a 550 to 560 lens because of focus breathing. It's got a lot of breathing in that lens. And the closer you are to your subject, the more that's apparent in the focal plane. So uh, here they are side by side at 600 millimeters with each lens. And as you can see, 
we're getting a larger image out of the Nikon. Interesting. Okay, so when we look at these images besides the size difference, let's take a look at this maxed out. Right now we're at 66.7 uh, zoom, and we're going to go all the way to 100% with uh, both of these images here so that we can do some pixel peeping at 100%. And uh, these are pretty square on with the camera, so whoops, you're not going to see too much of a difference here from side to side as far as feather detail. You can see the Sony does an excellent job. Now I'm going to move this over to about here, and now I'm going to move over to the Nikon and do the same so that we can compare the the feather detail and the Sony might be a tad sharper but boy oh boy it is so close that you probably would not notice a difference uh, with any of your photos. Um, now let's check on the left side just to make sure because if it's not a hundred percent square with the lens you might notice a little difference there. And again um, Gosh, it's so hard to tell. I, I'd call it a, a wash with both these lenses at 600 millimeters, which is excellent. All right, now this is where things get a little more interesting. Uh, just so you know, as a bird photographer, I would say a good 90% of the time when I'm photographing birds, I'm at 800 millimeters or above. And the reason for this is quite simple. 90 some percent of the time I'm shooting birds that are small. And uh, either that or I'm shooting an eagle or some other larger bird at a longer distance. And I find that the majority of the time I am using either a combination of lens and teleconverter or a prime lens such as the 800 uh, Nikkor Z lens, which is uh, without a teleconverter, to get myself to that range because I find that to be the sweet spot for photographing birds. So now in this particular setup, uh, you'll see that the Sony is on the far left in the middle is the Nikkor Z800 f6.3 and on the right is the Nikkor 180 to 600. So we're going to take a look at these all at 100%. Right now we're at 33% and I kind of lined them up this way because I wanted to show the comparison between all three lenses and what type of uh, image they produce as far as the size, the zoom capability of these lenses and of course the Sony is not really at 840 millimeters it's probably at 700 and something where I consider the one in the middle the Nikon Nikkor Z800 to be at a true 800 millimeter and at the far right is the 180 to 600 with its 1.4 which probably is pretty close to 840 it might be a little less than that maybe 820 or something it just looks a tad bigger than the true 800 in the middle. In any case, it's interesting when you take a look at the uh, reachability or zoom capability of all three of these lenses. But anyways, let's check out the resolution because this is the part that I am really interested in. So we're going to start with the Sony over here on the left. And again, the Sony and the Nikon, the one on the far left and right, are with teleconverters. So you're always going to lose something there when you uh, add a teleconverter. And typically the 1.4s don't screw things up too bad. So let's take a look at the right side of each of these images and see what we got here. Well, let's kind of zoom in here get that to a hundred percent and get it lined up properly 
and we'll do the same with the 180 to 600 on the far right here and we will zoom in as well again this is pixel peeping at its maximum so what you'd see in an actual photograph you probably wouldn't be able to tell the difference but you can see some difference here the thing that i find most amazing is the sony lens because it is a dang sharp lens and i i've scratched my head i know that people have commented on some of the forums that they don't like their sony 2 to 600 and when i bought that lens a couple of years ago i still had my canon 600 lens and I compared them side by side and I was flabbergasted because the Sony was just about as sharp as the 600 prime from Canon. That was the version two lens. And uh, sure enough, it's showing its colors here as well. If you look at the two on the left here, the Sony is this one here and the Nikkor 800 6.3 is here. And boy, oh boy, they are neck and neck. Uh, boy, I it just can't tell a difference there at all. Uh, then we look at the far right and we find our new lens, the 180 to 600 Nikkor. And there, there is a bit of a difference there. You know, again, we noticed it without the teleconverter and it might be slightly more noticeable here. But again, we're, we are just splitting hairs here really and um, you know any of these lenses are going to be great birding lenses there's just no doubt about it just out of curiosity let's take the shot on the right from the 180 to 600 and uh, i'm going to add a little bit of unsharp mask to that just to see how it looks with a bit of sharpening and uh, you know if we bring this up quite a bit here you got to remember these are really uh, high resolution shots so uh, I'm adding like 200 and some percent here and that really sharpens it up and now it actually looks a little sharper than the other two so you know the the thing is I'm just going to cancel that there the, the whole point is is that all three of these lenses are superb lenses and should be excellent for doing any kind of bird photography that you might want to do. Well, if you made it this far, I commend you for watching my video <laughs> through all those tests. In conclusion, I'd like to say that the Nikkor 180-600 is more than capable of taking great images. The only thing really that varies between all three of these lenses is not the resolution, but what type of environment you're shooting in. If you're shooting far away, you're always going to have atmospheric distortion playing a role. If you're shooting close, like birds in your backyard, you'll see much better feather detail with all three of these lenses. The only difference really between all three is that the 800 is a 6.3 lens. Uh, whereas if you put a teleconverter on this lens to get you to 840, you're shooting f9, just like the Sony. So your depth of field isn't as great. Uh, the bokeh won't be as beautiful, let's say, as the 800. So that's it for today. Thanks for watching. I'm going to conclude with a few photographs and a few videos that I've taken with this lens so far, just shooting birds in the backyard here. So take care, and thanks again for watching.